So I want to welcome everyone to MHCR's panel on insider reconciliation um, in line with this uh, semester's Peace Week theme, Ideas in Action. Um, very broadly, our panel is going to focus on the insider reconciler study that MHCR has been running for a year and a half now. Um, moving from theory, our scholarly contributions, and um, finally into, into practice land. Um, word of warning for all our wonderful attendees out there. The all-star amazing MHCR team is scattered across the world. Unfortunately, that means that sometimes there are technical issues and Wi-Fi outages. So I wanted to preempt everyone that sometimes folks are going to have their videos off. Um, audio might get a little bit choppy. Some of our staff might fall out of the presentation and come back in. Um, so just wanted to set that expectation up front. Um, we're gonna have uh, about an hour-ish of uh, presentation, maybe a little bit less depending on um, uh, if one of our speakers is able to make it. Then we're gonna move into a Q&A facilitated by the USIP superstar, Carl Stoffer. Thank you, Carl. Um, so we're going to be getting to uh, questions in the chat um, uh, in, in any other uh, more audio um, uh, audio questions at that point in time. So over to you, fearless leader, Auntie. Get us started. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, everybody who has been working hard to make this event happen. And I just want to share first that I'm calling from the Russian border in Finland and um, we have about 13 feet of snow in front of our, our window here. Uh, the house I'm calling from doesn't have electricity or running water. So my life is dependent on the sustainability of the iPad battery. Uh, it doesn't always cover all the zooms that, that I need to go through. But I wanted to also wear the special sweater because uh, this is when my dad was doing field research among the Sami indigenous peoples. Uh, and I as a small kid was running in his feet and causing trouble. So there might be some background noises. Uh, my sons are here, here with me uh, this time. And, and, and so the generation work is continuing, but by listening to those Sami healers um, and, 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 and uh, reconcilers, it really shaped my worldview. And uh, today when the Finnish government and the Sami people are working on truth and reconciliation process, I know that eventually it is up to these healers to find out how to heal their people. It may be very different what it looks like when they are working in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but one day they have to step up and, and lead that process as they have been doing for, for centuries. Um, I have had the true honor of being involved uh, in the Carter School at George Mason University now for almost two and a half years uh, by establishing this Mary Hope Center for Reconciliation. And it has been a true honor to be in, in one of the most distinguished schools and, and, and understand that the school has interest and curiosity in this concept of inside reconcilers because um, this idea is the main research question that the MHCR has taken upon itself. And, and we will be producing really significant studies over this topic in, in the coming years, including PhD theses, but also smaller research publications, uh, hopefully books, to introduce this and I'll just a little bit speak about the philosophy and the background of this concept because um, in peace mediation we often see that that when there's a parties of conflict somehow a third party appears in the center and there has been a lot of attention on these mediators especially in the UN realm in, in the in the world of diplomacy we give a lot of attention to these these mediators but also in a smaller scale when we look into legal mediation, for example, when they apply restorative justice in, in, um, in, in, in resolving uh, disputes before they go to court, there is a signed legal mediator between the parties. And, and so uh, this idea of a mediator has been influencing even of those more transformative methods. Um, however, what we have witnessed in the world is that uh, these peace agreements are not holding, they're falling apart. And therefore we have to dive much deeper into understanding what is the process that has to happen between the parties themselves. And, and parties that have been fighting each other, who have been fearing each other, who have been inflicting violence towards each other, it's just a really hard and complicated process. And by calling 
and, and signaling and focusing on the insider reconcilers, we recognize that within the parties, there are some individuals who are able to make that connection, almost like rewiring brain tissue, that there needs to be the first contact that starts to flow information, emotions, connections, and realign the parties. And we also want to understand the more incremental process of the parties, how they can move the reconciliation forward. But the first contact happens through those insider reconcilers. And they're often in a lot of pressure, sometimes under danger, under threat, uh, uh, being excluded or, or, or that they, they may even be killed for what they do. So we, we have wanted to recognize and honor these insider reconcilers, but also to help to reshape this field. Uh, so MHCR has an ambition that through this research, we'll be providing something significant and practical. And by this way, model also how the research that we do can feed into practice. And I've been just so thrilled and honored to see this incredible commitment that you all will see from our students. Uh, so thank you, Nick. Thank you, Oakley. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Cam. And thank you, Hannah, for all you have done in this research and, and continue to do. What we have wanted to do also from the beginning is that we are guided in this process by true insiders. So one of the philosophy of, um, of uh, MHCR has been to, uh, to invite uh, leading insiders into fellowship. And we are just so thankful for you, Rhoda Olad, who, have, who is joining from Somalia and Tekla Namachana Wanjala from, from Kenya not all what you have done, but what you continue to do with us so that we can learn by observing, working with you, and also hopefully in the future doing more research on the way you are operating to bring that knowledge into global awareness and, and help, help shape our understanding of the roles of insiders who are not just working at the community level, but then also are influencing the whole national process as in, in your both cases you have been. Um, Finally, I wanted to express my, my gratitude to my, my dear friend and colleague at US Institute of Peace, um, senior expert Carl Stauffer. Carl is a true hero in the field of transition justice. Uh, he's been doing field work uh, more perhaps than, than, than research, but he's also a true academic. And uh, having somebody like Carl with such an insightful understanding in, in the significant institution at USIP gives us a lot of hope because he will help to translate and he's already helping to translate what is the work that Tecla is doing and RODAS are doing and the communities are doing for state level actors. Because what we have seen is, is in, in the state level and among the funders, a lot of lack of understanding of this kind of significant work. And if Carl succeed, which we hope he will and will do everything we can to help him, there'll be further funding flows for the insiders and, and their especially significant role. My final noticed that, um, that Nick Sherwood, who has decided to do his PhD on this topic is also focusing on the well-being and resilience of the insiders. So amidst all of those pressures, how can you sustain your energy, your strength, and, and, and can continue to, to, to do your work is something we want to understand. And thank you, Nick, for choosing that topic. Uh, we find your research extremely timely and significant. So thank you everybody for joining uh, and being part of this process. And, and I look forward to following all the presentations, the conversations. Back to you, Nick. Great, thank you so much, Auntie. And Cam, over to you to tell uh, tell our audience participants a little bit more about MHCR. Hey everyone, can you guys see my screen? Cool. All right, guys. So this is this is the this is our the MHCR annual report. Uh, this is just work that we have conducted over the past year and some change, and we'll just go through this a little bit to provide some context in, into the work that we've done. So this is our mission statement. We're uh, the goal is to bring leading reconciliation experts and scholars together to both uh, research reconciliation practices and develop the impact of ongoing and future reconciliation processes. Which bring, which is how we were able to bring together this panel uh, full of experts in the field and, and everyone who has contributed to bringing this to life. And this is also, it also mentions our namesake, Mary Hope, who was a pioneer within the field. And we continue to honor her memory with the 
with the work that we do. So this is, so after last year, um, after the murder of George Floyd, we kind of shifted um, some of the work that we've done. We started conducting um, some work within the US and this was an article written by myself, which talked about some of these initiatives and the work that we've done to, and you know, why, why we felt that we needed to shift from, you know, not just being an international organization to also bringing some of these, some of our practices and expertise um, into our own backyard. Okay, and speaking of conflict in our own backyard, um, our one of our senior research professors, Eduardo Gonzalez, um, who has worked on truth commissions all over the world, um, Peru, in Africa, um, yeah, and so he he had helped within he had helped establish one within Iowa in the U.S. and also he has been working on a transitional justice course um, in the U.S. for those who want to help establish truth commissions. Uh, these are some of the local initiatives that we've taken part in, and we also, and we also have, um, we've moved beyond the U.S. Um, doing some international reconciliation work. And so Auntie specifically has, we, well, we've been working closely with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Finland, as Auntie mentioned, that's where he is based. And um, we've taken a lot of expertise from them and also helped that to inform some of the reconciliation practices that we have done. We've also conducted work in Alaska and Myanmar in developing peace building leadership skills. Okay, and these are our insider reconciler fellows, which you will you will get to meet two of them later. Uh, as we mentioned before, Dr. Tekla Namachanja Wanjala and Rauda Abdullahi Olad uh, will be participating. Um, and we also have uh, Ms. Betty Bagombe, who is based in Uganda, but they will talk uh, more about their work throughout the throughout the presentation. So sustaining peace building, social healing, and transformation, uh, we've launched um, multiple initiatives over over uh, our time as a as a center, um, such as the Think Peace podcast, which was helped uh, produced by myself and Khaled Rausch, uh, another one of our senior research professors. Um, we have also published Neural Peace, which was edited by um, Khaled Rausch, and it's an online open source series focusing on research and practice at the nexus of neuroscience and peace building and the community of practice, which also brings together um, leading practitioners, scholars, and students aimed at advancing a cultural shift where leaders of social transformation center individual and collective transformation efforts to build more inclusive and just societies. And, and these things are all a part of our uh, social healing and transformation. And they're focusing on the impacts. To, they're very trauma-informed. Um, and the Think Peace podcast, um, also had Dr. Tekla Namachanja Wanjala on there. Okay, so um, this is our TRL, which leads the which leads our flagship Inside a Reconciler study, which is led by Nick, and uh, also has Bell and Oakley, who are some of the integral members of the team. Also, uh, Hannah Adamson, who was on the call as well. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the Inside a Reconciler project. We've also done the impact of COVID-19 on religious leaders and communities and approximating expert knowledge of reconciliation models and methods and an evidence review for USIP. Oh, and I forgot to mention also the TRL has post, has done 21 conference presentations, two publications, has received over $150,000 in external grant funding, and we have five research products to date. Um, also, some of the other things that we've done, uh, we've launched the MHCR webinar series. We've had five webinars, over 2,000 registrants, 14 organization partners, and 600 plus YouTube views, which has gone up since this was last posted. And we've had over 37 speakers. Um, yes, yeah, so our, our webinar series, they, they mainly focus on connecting change makers, working towards truth, healing, 
and racial justice, as well as transitional justice and multiple other topics which we've led uh, webinars on. And also uh, one of the big, one of the, the main cores of MHCR is the student leadership. We, we like to, we have a lot of mentors um, who help provide, who help provide us with information to, you know, move towards a better future for, um, for the field of peace building. And the students are very much empowered to take what they've learned from their mentors to, and take that into practice. Okay, so our so our research helps to redefine reconciliation. So some of these traditional peace building models hinge on the role of the third party individuals and organizations who are not native or indigenous to a given conflict context. Um, and when the, the field is first developed, leaders in our field believe third party interveners may be neutral and impartial within conflict context, um, giving these actors an ability to remain more objective and clear headed during peace building, building processes. But um, over the years, we've learned that this has changed and, you know, working within these fields is, you know, it's hard to necessarily be impartial, you know, um, people have to have a vested interest in wanting to see these things into fruition. And this is where our insider reconcilers come in. And this is just, these are some of our partners. We also have a quote from Dr. Carl Starf Stouffer, who is on our call. And these are just some anecdotes from the team. Um, you know, we're glad to be a part of the team and just our just our approach in building the center into what it is today. Um, we're, we've only, we're in, we haven't even made it to three years yet, but we've made a substantial impact within the field of peace building. And we're looking forward to seeing more of what we can do um, over, over the next few years. So these are some of our donors, and these this is how you can support MHCR. And this is our wonderful team, who is some of us are on the call, some have moved on, and but yeah, this is our um, this is the MHCR team. So thank you guys. Great, thank you, Cam. And if you can bring up a slide deck, that would be great. Um, over to you, Hannah. Are you able to are you able to join in via audio? Yes, I am. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everybody on the call. Um, I am the program officer at MHCR and also a student in the accelerated master's program at the Carter School. Um, I do want to apologize for having my video off, but for limited Wi-Fi reasons, I will be keeping it off so that I can continue to hear and speak with you all. Um, before I jump into things, I do want to take a moment to recognize uh, the wonderful presentation of the report by Cam and also the beautiful way it's presented in that report, which was lead author Marisa Maddox, our um, grant uh, development coordinator at MHCR. And she couldn't be on the call today, but she passes on her best, and I just wanted to recognize that. Um, so now jumping a little bit into our Insider Reconciler study and a little bit more about that program. Um, I'll be talking a bit more about what an insider reconciler is and what the criteria for somebody um, might be. So um, this was a topic first explored by Letterac and Ware in 1991 um, in the exploration of the Nicaraguan peace processes throughout the 1990s. And it was originally um, discussed as an insider partial, as somebody who already has a connection to the conflict um, going on. And oftentimes they were talking specifically about insider mediators bringing two different parties together in the process. So now we're looking at um, a subsect of the insider partials, um, insider reconcilers, people bringing together, uh, pe people bringing parties together after violence has occurred. Um, so these people often have connection and existing trust built with one or more parties in conflict, often meaning that they too are part of those parties. Um, and they are able to have additional credibility because of these relationships built within the conflict context. 
Additionally, um, these people continue to live in the conflict following the peace processes. So this gives them an additional stake in whatever process is going on because they too have something to gain or lose in being able to overcome the negative cycles of violence and conflict. So if you move to the next slide, um, we can talk a little bit more about the potential benefits and risks of this approach. So um, for potential benefits, um, uh, Apologies, I was just lagging on the slide there. I've got it now. Um, the potential benefits include having a deeper understanding of the conflict and its entry points. So as somebody living day in and day out in the conflict context, um, insider reconcilers are more adept in identifying people that we can connect with, processes that can be constructed within the cultural dynamics of the conflict itself in a way that an outsider may not be able to perceive initially. And in a similar way, they can improve information flows between uh, the two parties, two or more parties in conflict, but also with any external uh, mediators coming in, NGOs, government organizations, and authority figures. So in this way, they're dispersing information both horizontal, horizontally and vertically within the conflict. Insider reconcilers often champion locally designed solutions, again, as they understand and are part of the cultural dynamics and unique needs of the conflict situation. They are able to develop things that are uniquely attuned to those specific needs and also create sustainable community um, long after outsiders have left. However, this does not come without its share of potential risks. So being an insider reconciler often means that you are working within a conflict context before anybody has recognized the work that you're doing. And it means that you're working informally and bringing people together often before there's resources there to support you. So this can be particularly challenging, and I'm sure maybe our Insider Reconciler Fellows will speak to this later. Um, and an additional risk is that whenever funding or connections with external parties to help the peace process come in, there's the risk of being overpowered or overshadowed by external actors working to implement their own solutions that potentially have not consulted Insider Reconcilers and the existing work already happening on the ground. Furthermore, insider reconcilers may be negatively influenced by the problematic power dynamics of the conflict context. So if there um, is pow power imbalance, gatekeeping, corruption at local government levels in the conflict itself, insiders may be limited in the capacity that they are able to implement their solutions. And furthermore, um, while, as we talked about at the beginning, insider reconcilers have a much deeper understanding of the conflict itself, they may not have a comparative knowledge that an outsider may have from working in, say, five different conflict zones and being able to compare and contrast what worked in each unique situation. Um, so that is just kind of one of the trade-offs that comes with it. It's a very, very quick snapshot um, from this uh, topic that's originated from 1991 um, onward till now. Um, and we're really working to understand this more by actually connecting with insider reconcilers, which is something that no other study has done to date. And to talk to you more about that, I'm going to pass it off to Bell and Oakley. Thank you. Great, hello, my name is Oakley. Uh, I've been the lab manager at MHCR now for uh, a little while. Um, so I'm going to talk just very briefly about the methods, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to Bell to talk uh, more in depth about the analysis. So the research question, I, I decided to put it right here at the top, is what are the experience of insider reconcilers currently engaged in transformative reconciliation processes in conflict contexts? So uh, I feel like Auntie gave a pretty good introduction, and, and, and Hannah, thank you very much. Um, Hannah did a fantastic literature uh, review about insiders. Um, so also thank you for adding the citation. That's, that's, some, that's some helpful stuff. Um, so, so, so the way we've been collecting data is through a purposive snowball sampling method. So we begin with our own network, people that we are aware of, um, and we, we invite them to be participants in the study. Um, and then from our immediate network, we're interested in going out and, and deep. So what I mean by that is going out into new contexts. So, so far we've, we've interviewed insider reconcilers from Myanmar, Burma, <clears throat> Kenya, Libya, the United States, and Finland. 
Um, we're also interested in, in going out into new contexts um, as, as we become aware of more insider reconcilers, and then also uh, going deeper inside in, in a particular context, uh, just learning more about uh, inviting more participants um, in any of the contexts that we've um, found insider reconcilers previously. Um, and then uh, once one has agreed to participate in the study, we conduct a qualitative semi-structured interviews over Zoom. Uh, for those interested in qualitative methods, uh, what's nice about doing it over Zoom is you don't have to fly there. <laughs> That's a big plus. Um, it saves a lot. It saves us a lot of money. Um, and then there's also an added bonus when uh, when you when you move to transcription, uh, Zoom transcribes things uh, not very well, but it does transcribe them. And if you're a little clever about it, you can save yourself a lot of time on the back end with transcription. So that's nice. Um, these interviews cover three themes. I'm not going to get into these because Bell will get into them in more depth. Um, but we, we, uh, we ask insider reconcilers about their conceptualization, how they're conceptualizing and operationalizing the, the term reconciliation. So what does reconciliation mean to them? Um, their experiences facilitating reconciliation processes. We're, we're very interested in that. And then also we're, we're very interested in this well-being aspect. What is the impact of reconciliation processes on their well-being, um, and then uh, a second question that goes along with the practice end of MHCR, and how can we support them? Um, how how can how can we add value? How can we um, support them as they're engaging in peace processes? So uh, with that, I'll I'll uh, I'll stop and I'll I'll turn it over to Bell. Thank you, Oakley. Hi everyone. Um, I go by Bell. Um, I'm originally from Albania. I grew up in Italy and the U.S. I'm calling in from North Macedonia. I'm a PhD candidate at the Carter School, and I'll be speaking a little more about the analysis for um, the INREC study. So um, as you can see from the slide, um, the qualitative method we're using to analyze data it's a pretty common uh, used one, it's a thematic analysis. And we choose this uh, so that we can uh, specifically study uh, those units of meanings that are produced by people in relation to events and uh, within their environments. So then uh, primarily um, we're interested um, in, in thematic analysis as a flexible tool uh, which helps us to see perspectives, uh, a perspective of another person as well as make sense and connect information that may not seem uh, related. And so in other words, we're looking for patterns here, right? We're digging down on each interview and seeing if there are patterns. Um, specifically, um, I started, I'm one of the newest members here. I joined in January. So I started uh, by doing this by coding. Uh, for the purpose of this study, uh, uh, coding has, it's being done manually, although there are softwares out there. Um, simply put, coding is, um, is, is, um, is done by assigning um, codes to words, sets of words or sentences. And so um, coding um, it, it, it is a bit of a fancy way of saying assigning a number or, or a letter um, most commonly, it's a number to these um, to data, and data by data we mean information provided by by the participant. Um, some general guidelines here that um, we've been using um, with the first ten interviews um, that we have um, analyzed and coded, uh, they provide us this wonderful overview of of what could be um, of what is really a foundation for future interviews. Um, another guideline that uh, it's useful for us as we do this is um, using these uh, three clusters that Oakley and Hannah have mentioned. Um, th this slide is more of a, um, an example, but um, so our three clusters are understanding reconciliation. Second is re the role of insider reconcilers. Third one, well-being in reconciliation practices. And so um, coding, is basically I take 
an interview, I have it in front of me. And the very first thing I do is I scan it in its entirety so that I can be familiar with what's in front of me and the direction of it. And then second, I do what I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. I give a code to uh, either words or a collection of words or even paragraphs sometimes really. Um, I'm guided in this by uh, knowing what questions belong to which cluster, right? So within each cluster, then I have uh, themes and even sub themes, of course. Um, direct outcomes from uh, this kind of analysis really is a number of things um, I can mention at this time with an example here in the slide. It's, um, of course, we'll have a collection of all participants coded responses, which will be organized by themes and clusters. Um, of course, also a report on all themes as well as prevailing ones, right? Uh, we want to see, for example, our um, um, the information we gather, if it really falls within some of the expectations we have, right? Um, and of course, um, the second part there, um, highlighted in red at the bottom there, that's an example of how it will look, the Excel spreadsheet collection. Right, And so you see those three uh, clusters, each cluster has a theme of what that particular participant um, is speaking about, right? So the Excel spreadsheet just has a lot of numbers, but if I can share my screen just very briefly, am I able to share my screen? You should be able to, I made you co -host. Thank you. I just wanted to share this story because for me, this is what analyzing all of this means. Um, so I think you can see it, right? Um, basically what we're doing is we're following, you know, you may think that you're following one, two threads, but then you see how it's connected to another one and so on. And then at some point you do some, you, you zoom out, right? Or zoom in as you choose and you see how things are um, connected. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bob. <clears throat> All righty. You go to the next slide, please, Cam. Right, so y'all have heard from our team um, who we are, sort of the birth of the Insider Reconciler study, um, moved through the pilot phase. So we've got 10 interviews done, um, aiming to have another 15 to 20 done by um, end of this summer. Where do we go from here, right? We've done the analysis. We're now in the midst of write-up. Um, part of the ethos at MHCR, and I think the Carter School more broadly, is that we're not um, satisfied with just putting journal articles or books kind of into the ether, right? There needs to be some sort of um, a, a practical impact on the field. Um, so while the study has been taking place, um, we have allowed insights from our Insider Reconciler study to supplement, to guide, um, to shape various practice initiatives being done at MHCR. Um, briefly touching on a few of those things, USIP, thank you, Carl, for the funding. USIP um, is contracting us to contribute um, to a technical manual or some sort of um, uh, some sort of publication that's going to go on to empower USIP staff. Um, one of my big goals um, for this publication specifically is for uh, more formalized peace building employees. So folks who would work at USAID or USIP, I, I would like for them to be able to uh, be able to recognize one who insider partials and insider reconcilers are and how to support their unique needs. Um, I think that infiltrating insights from this study into large scale peace building organizations is a really, really good way to sort of distribute the, the, the insider reconcilers knowledge and wisdom. Um, moving on from there, the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs has, uh, as part of our ongoing um, grant with them, uh, do, working on reconciliation in the Horn of Africa. Um, we're co-constructing an online open reconciliation portal. So this is going to be sort of a compendium of, uh, of resources for reconciliation practitioners, scholars, and students. Um, many, many sort of bite-sized quotes from our insider reconciler interviews are going to be able to populate the website. Some of our participants said 
basically, hey, you can use my interview data however you want. Um, you're, you're, you know, feel free to use my name on any of the publications that come out of this. So that data is going to be able to, to go to inform. I'm particularly excited about the students. They can look up and say, oh, my gosh, here's a direct quote from someone who's doing the work that I want to do, um, the kind of work that I want to do in the future. Um, Moving out of the sort of the, the, the broad INREC idea into my bailiwick, um, which is the well being and resilience um, component of all of this. Um, in fall of 2020, Professor Mark Gopin and I co taught a course on well being and peace building, um, which I want to thank the Carter School for allowing us to, to put that course together. Um, served a few different purposes. One really cool um, purpose that served for me was as a sort of a, a pedagogical um, experiment. When you take a group, and I'm talking about Carter School master's students predominantly, when you have a group of 10, 15 master's students who are all interested in the peace building field, what are the most important lessons about well-being promotion, about resilience building that we can, that we can teach them? Uh, one thing I would like to see in all graduate programs uh, focusing on peace building, conflict resolution is a required course on how to take care of ourselves once we're in the field, um, especially for insiders who are seen sometimes by folks in their own communities as traitors. Um, they're often walking between cultures, between conflict sites, between worlds. That produces a massive, that can produce a massive psychological burden. Um, and so to, I believe to make the peace building field, to, to make insider reconciliation more sustainable, um, we have to be really, really honing in on how to support the health, well-being, mental health um, of insider reconcilers. Um, as Auntie mentioned before, um, I recently pivoted my dissertation project to do a follow-up um, uh, follow research on uh, focusing specifically on resilience building within insider reconcilers. So I've got Karina Crosslin and Dan Rothbard on my committee. And we're working together to figure out how we can build typologies of resilient peace builders. What, what, what are the different resilience building strategies peace builders already engage in, insider reconcilers already engage in? If we can identify those strategies, then the idea is we can craft workshops, trainings, coursework, et cetera, to play to the character strengths of, the, of these individuals. Um, I think that's it. So. Um, Cam, let's go to the next slide. Um, we have two amazing, incredible, show-stopping insider reconcilers that are part of the MHCR team. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Rhoda Olad, um, we are ready for you when you are, sister. Uh, thank you, Nick. Greetings of peace. And I think it's Ramadan, so I'm hungry. If you don't hear my voice, you can let me know. <laughs> And thank you, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you all and thank you for inviting uh, with me to be part of this very important Peace Week event. I think both uh, Auntie and Nick mentioned it about the importance of field work and the practical lessons to combine with the theories we learn in the classroom. So therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you a recent clan violence that took place in Gelmudu region in Somalia, where I also happened to be as an insider reconciler to get involved in the mediation of the two uh, wiring body. So I hope uh, we can all find this story. So of course, it's a sad story, relevant to our work as an insider reconcilers and as an international peacemakers. Uh, Nick, can you all hear me clearly? Just to check my mic. Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you, thank you. I just didn't put on the video uh, because I'm worried about that might slow down the internet. So um, in February, just last February in this year, I was in the middle of my campaign uh, for the position of mem member of the parliament in Somalia. By the way, I was not successful in the election. I didn't make it. So I received a call from a colleague in Columbus, Ohio, who need uh, my assistance in de-escalating violence between two clans in Galmudu region. So this is the story. So I want you to follow on this story because I'm trying to, give, to bring a field work uh, to our conversation. But also it's very complex to understand 
but what I may, what I will do is I will simplify and I will uh, highlight the key areas that touch my heart to, uh, during my work in Gilmuduk region for this specific incident. So, a man from Clancy, I wanna, I, there is a two, this involves on two clannies, so I label it, so bear with me. So a clan from uh, Clan C, a man from Clan C killed a man from a uh, different clan in the region, which we can call as a S clan. So the S clan came out and they revenged by killing a college student from the region from Clan C. If you don't understand, you can later ask me questions about this. So that is uh, why my colleagues uh, back in Ohio who are relatives to, uh, to the first man that got killed reached me out since I was uh, that part of the country about uh, because the killing will have been continued without intervention. So they asked me how I can assist on this. So it was important to also to seek the intervention of the traditional leaders and usually those kind of cases, uh, traditional leaders deal with. But this was kind of like killing each other. There was no uh, dialogue or any negotiation on the table for somehow. The tension was too high. But what was very interesting on in this case was uh, being involved as a female on this case, particularly a place where I couldn't get elected because of being women, was what was even making uh, different on the case when I look back. But deep in my mind, I also thought about a number of things that associates around uh, this issue. The first one was what I needed to initiate engagement between the two wiring clans so that I, they could sit down and to pay what commonly we call a Somalis duo, which means a blood money. I reached out both clans and I tried to be familiar with the situation. So we, I think Hannah was talking about uh, insider reconcilers versus, versus outsider reconcilers. But sometimes as an insider reconcilers, some situation you also have to, you will also see yourself as an outsider reconcilers. So I took time to get familiar with the situation. And what I learned is uh, apart from history of prior care, killings on these two clans, it came to conclusion, unless the clan S, which the clan that killed the Yangi uh, college student as a revenge, moves forward with some traditional demands, no engagement will be possible to happen. So therefore, I investigate and I try, I call uh, several traditional leaders of clan C to understand what are the demands in place. Uh, to initiate the dialogue between the two clans. So the clan C that had lost it, uh, of its member had drawn up a list of four demands. One is a gap, which was worth $1,400. And the second one was uh, uh, $1,000 as a penalty for the murder. And another uh, point was the third one was a $1,000 for burial. And the fourth one is the, uh, a young girl. So they put in place for those four conditions. So that's one thing. The second thing that got stuck in my mind was the causal of the killings, which is only clan association. So there was no any other reason. One get killed and the other get revenge. And this will go on and on. And that's how it leads uh, conflict between clans and killings uh, each other. And what is more scary was the traditional leaders of the clan C called me and they uh, say the young man in the clan had sworn if the case does not get settled, they will retaliate uh, uh, by also killing a member from the other clan. And here, Bull Roda, as an outside reconciler on this situation, I'm listening to all these things which I could not comprehend when compared to my experience. Yes, I'm Somali and I'm involved on different uh, reconciliation process, but this case was completely different. It was a deep in different region and completely different areas of, the, of, 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 of my convert to And 
of course, I couldn't handle to see more kings within the region. So I, I, it was a nightmare. So it was very sad. Both the other sad part of this story was uh, both families who have lost their loved ones only entitled a very small percentage of the money, and, and they receive either the blood money or the or the other engagements. But the saddest of all of them was the use of the exchange of the young girl to bring this between the two wiring clans. And the uh, clan C, when I spoke to them, they made it clear for me, this is what we have done in the past. This is how we have solved our uh, differences. And this is how we did the exchange. So this is just the initial engagement is, but also the deal could be over uh, 50,000 or 100,000 later on. But the initial engagement is to de-escalate the, the violence these are the four requirements. So I try to learn more the reasons of using the young girl and they say exchanging the young girl will lead to some level of peace between the clans, even though it was not guaranteed that they will stay forever uh, peace. So I told the traditional leaders of the danger of such practice, which uh, indeed was a cult, they're, cult, they're part of the, uh, their cultural part, uh, for bringing a peace. So what I did is I offered them uh, a total of $3,000 with the support of my colleagues in Ohio. So I told them, okay, here is the deal. I will, instead of uh, traditional leaders going back to the clan and collecting money and all these things, especially uh, this kind of time that the region suffers a drought, I will offer for you uh, to pay this, this amount of money but in exchange, what I need is not to use uh, as part of the negotiation of the young girl uh, to bring peace between the clans. So it was no gossip for me. So, uh, and what also helped me is my understanding of the local cultural context helping me because that's what the traditional leaders understand. So in the process, also, my skills as a peacemaker and mental health practitioners were very useful in the persuasion and engagement of the elders. So at the end of the story, they took uh, my proposal and we made agreement using a young girl means of peace should not be part of the negotiation. So that was good. As an insider and outsider reconciler, this experience made me feel uh, the need to study further and explore this old practice of using young girls to settle conflicts. The community also needs to understand that exchanging one life for another is not uh, the best way to maintain a harmony because it also violates the rights of women, which they need to understand um, on women's perspective and as a community as a whole. So also, if you look on the other side today, there are many international uh, organizations, international and local organizations that work in Somalia and many other parts of the world uh, doing a peace building and communal, even higher level of engagement of peace building uh, work. But in most cases, a lot of attention is not given to how African communities as they are traditionally set up or solve their conflicts. As an insider, a counselor is, and um, I think Takla will also explain more, we often invited to facilitate this kind of reconciliation meetings. But in some instances, the deeper and the underlying issue are not recognized. So in this case, uh, this case was an eye opening for me as an insider counselor. And I feel like I need to be involved even more to be able to create that desired empathy in the community. And my plan is uh, to bring such clans together in a human way so they can make a commitment towards peace within their community and personalize the killings and practice and help them understand how this impacts them as an individual, as a family, as a whole. But also I think what will change uh, the perceptions on that region specifically in Gilmuru will be as a female uh, peacemaker to be involved in these uh, very serious cases. I hope that will also change uh, the perceptions that they believe uh, against the women.
So I would like to create a documentary that sheds more light on some of these issues and help both insiders and outsiders reconcile this approach to similar situations. But most importantly, we must continue to educate communities about the danger of conflict and the benefit of living uh, in harmony. And also we need to keep in mind this type of work, of course, requires time, resource and expertise, but we can do one at a time. And I'm uh, really uh, honored and, 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 and really appreciate the work that uh, students at George Mason and Mary Hawk Center are doing uh, on this work that's very relevant of my life and our life around uh, peace builders uh, work. So I would like to hand over to Takla and I think he part of who I am and everything. I think that introduction has been made already. So I skipped on that part. So I hand over to Takla, Dr. Takla. Hello? Thank you. Uh, thank you, my sister Rauda, uh, for that uh, inspiring uh, presentation and the case that you've handled. I really appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if uh, my voice is also clear from Nairobi. Testing, testing. We hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, when I looked at the, the question that was presented to me, and uh, I looked at the emails, there were no specific questions. I looked at the emails and uh, I chose to narrow my presentation to three questions. How I conceptualize uh, intergroup reconciliation as an insider reconciler, again, using a case study that uh, I used some time back. I will also look at the, the strategies that I used, that I found useful, and then look at uh, the last question, uh, the challenges that I may have faced physically, emotionally. And uh, the starting point, I must say that uh, the question sent me down the memory lane. And if I was to write a book, that is what I would have called it, down the memory lane. The next title, I'll, I'll have called it, uh, called, qualified, and commissioned. Uh, so to the question, how uh, do I conceptualize or how did I conceptualize um, reconciliation, intergroup reconciliation uh, at that time that I intervened using this case study? Um, if I was to define what I was doing, I would have said that finding a lasting solution to the problems affecting the two communities that were in a conflict. The case study I am using is the time when I was uh, the relief and rehabilitation coordinator for 40,000 ethnic uh, of ethnic clashes. And uh, so as the person in charge of relief and rehabil rehabilitation under the church, my role was mainly to alleviate the suffering of the internally displaced victims, to find solutions to their problems. And uh, so I ensured that uh, we had food in the camps. I ensured that we had functional structures in the camps who could help us manage the camps. There were about 80 major camps uh, of 40,000 internally displaced uh, victims. 
uh, we ensured that we were the voice of the victims because at that time that we intervened uh, during our first clashes in 1991-92, uh, the government denied actually that we had IDPs when we had over 300,000 all over Kenya in the region where I worked, we had 40,000. So I had to be the voice of the internally displaced uh, victims of ethnic clashes. And I did all I could to update the, my boss who was the Bishop of the Catholic Church uh, where I was working. So this was my role. And Around this time, what I should mention, this was way back in 1991-1992, Kenya was an island of peace surrounded by our neighbors, affected by drought and violent conflict, looking at Ethiopia, looking at Somalia, looking at uh, Sudan and Uganda. So this is the time that we did not have terminologies like peace builders. By then we only had two organizations that were working in the area of peace building, but they were all looking outside Kenya. Uh, People for Peace in Africa and Nairobi Peace Initiative. So when we had this major challenge after the introduction of multi-party politics in Kenya, where our first general election, uh, elections were accompanied by violent conflicts, the people that came in to support were mainly from the church and religious institutions and local community-based organizations. The professions that uh, the leaders from the churches looked uh, to support were those from social work, development, teachers, and nurses. I just happened to have completed my diploma in social development. And that is how I was invited uh, to support the internally displaced victims of clashes. So I worked, my initial work was uh, a supporting relief. But as we continued supporting relief, we reached a place where we were fatigued, the donor fatigued. Three years down the line, we've been providing relief uh, with the support of donors, religious institutions. They got fatigued. We reached a time we did not have enough food in the camps. We did not have enough medical uh, medicine in the camps. Uh, so malnutrition was very high in the camps. Uh, and like in all conflicts, whenever there is a conflict, we have both groups affected. So as I was serving majority IDPs who are evicted from this region, I used to go to the region where they were evicted from also to serve a few uh, from this community for lack of a better word, we called them perpetrators. Then while there, I also noticed that it's not just the IDPs in the field that were frustrated, but even them, because most of the schools where they were taking the, the children for studies were in the area of their so-called enemies, where IDPs were. Most of the good medical services this area is very fertile. They produce a lot of food stuffs, but because of the conflict, they were not able to go and sell their food on the market. So trade was not taking place. When I saw the situation and somebody who was in charge of finding solutions, I said, these people are better off, the IDPs that is, are better off back to their homes. And that is where now I started the process of reconciling the two communities. So my conceptualization 
of uh, reconciliation among these two groups was, I wanted to find a lasting solution to the problems affecting the two communities in the conflict so that they can peacefully coexist again. And the starting point was uh, to understand how the IDPs were evicted from their homes. So I had a series of meetings uh, where they shared under what circumstances they left. Then they sent me to their neighbors to go and find out uh, why they evicted their neighbors. So I went there and had a series of meetings. So for me, I came to learn later that I was facilitating reconciliation. Now, when I entered in a class of peace building years later, that I was supporting uh, reconciliation among these communities. Now, to the strategies. What, reflecting back, what strategies did I use that I found very uh, useful? I have explained one already. We found the right moment. The donor, the donor fatigue, lack of food in the camps, the market was not functioning. And so we were tired and the conflict was tired. So the two groups then were able or they were ready to sit together and discuss the conflict they were experiencing. Another strategy that I used, I came from the what now I used to call the victim, we used to call the victim uh, community. So my community was among the people who were evicted. And going back to start the facilitation process from the area that we were addicted, I needed somebody to front. And so I came to learn later, I identified a young man whom I used to work with in the camp. I knew he was from this community. He was respected. And I asked him, can he help me get the youths who are still staging attacks and retreating in the camps to the negotiating table. So a critical yeast, the way we understand in peace building was very important. He helped me to get the youths to the negotiating table from the perpetrator community or from the offenders community. Now, having gotten the youths to the negotiating table, this is the time again, we could not openly discuss about ethnic clashes, the government did like that. So coming from the church, we used the development as an entry point in terms of coming up with the question for discussion. And the question was, how were youths involved in development and if they faced any challenges? I knew that the first challenge they were going to highlight maybe were clashes. And so when we came to coming up with strategies on how to intervene in the challenges, I knew that the chance of discussing the ethnic clashes were very high. So that was another strategy that I used. And so uh, again, I had to front somebody as much as uh, I prepared everything, I came from one of the groups that, were, that was in conflict and I needed time to buy trust from these young people. So there is no way I was just going to facilitate this meeting, but I took one of my colleague I was working with who was a man and uh, I fronted him. Why? Because he was a man. Second, because he did not come from the three communities that were in conflict. And uh, this worked well for us. 
And so again, I was a young woman and uh, looking at the youths, uh, in Africa, we have strong initiation process. They could not listen to a young woman who was only 29 years old. And so during the introduction, I told them my place was going to be in the kitchen. That is where they expected me to be. Uh, so after the preliminaries, I picked a jug of water, uh, pretending to go to the kitchen, but actually I listened to the proceedings by the window. And each time I wanted to make a point, I came with a jug of water as I poured to the next glass, even if it was half full, I made my point. Uh, the third day, the young people realized that actually I was making good points and they invited me. I had gained their trust. So I came to call this soft power. I used soft power power as a young woman and later I became their darling. They even offered to give me land uh, to go and plant onions. I wish I had accepted. Now when after the sessions with the youths they accepted to uh, meet with their neighbors who were in the camps and when we started joint meetings I had to bring the government leaders on board and made them to co-chair because I knew most of the solutions had to do with the government. And so uh, they embraced that and they accepted to co-chair. I respected our culture and its role in uh, reconciliation as a strategy. And during meetings, I used to invite a woman from the survivor community from the camp to open the meeting with prayer. And instead of praying, she could start a Christian lamentation song. And before we realized, we were all crying and mourning with her. When we finished the meeting, I invited a young man from by then the perpetrator community to close a meeting with prayer. He prayed, he didn't sing. But instead of addressing the meeting, he addressed God and lamented the structural injustices this marginalized community had to go through. And that time we could all fidget in, the, in our chairs, especially the government officials. And at the end, they could tell me, uh, Tekla, please, can we just start the meeting without prayer? but I knew we needed to grieve. I knew we, that was the only way those women uh, could pass the message because they could not face the government officials directly. And that worked very well. Then I had respect for our culture. I knew that in our culture, once you have uh, been in conflict and you've shed blood, you cannot share in the common meal, a common meal. So during tea time, we used to have uh, donuts, we call them mandasis, but I used to put them in three pots and I could watch each group congregating in their own space. Then there was one in the middle that as facilitators used, but I used to fill it. With the time I noticed, they started to pick from this common Court, then I realized that they may have gone through the cleansing rituals and they were able now uh, to eat together. And I realized that was the moment that reconciliation was happening. Those are the strategies that I used. Now, when it comes to the impact of reconciliation on the reconciler as an individual and uh, collective being, well-being, I will start with the positive. Uh, impact. It led to my personal transformation. It has been a journey of 30 years with a few stops, a few turns, but towards the same destiny. This is where I started 
This was my first class in the field of peace building, conflict transformation. As I listened to the stories, I got to understand our situation better. For a long time, I thought that my community were victims, survivors, that they were just evicted. But when I listened to the stories, I realized that my neighbors were equally victims. This time, though we were victims of direct violence, but they were victims of structural violence perpetrated by administrative structures, which had most of the staff there from my community. This is what politicians manipulated for us to fight their war. And that is how I understood that the line between the victim and the community in intra-conflict is really blurred. Listening to their stories, I was able to ascend from my ethnic cocoon, from my ethnic space, to be able to look at the situation objectively and to support it uh, in more effective way. And I, it was at that moment that I got the urge to even understand the dynamics of conflict. Because while I thought we were victims, they were perpetrators, I was looking at the symptoms. I had not looked at the issues deeply and the root causes. And that is why I got the urge to continue studying so that uh, I could get uh, to understand. Uh, having understood, I became the devil's advocate for our community. I helped them to understand our own role in the conflict and that facilitated reconciliation very well. Those were the positive. How about the negative impact? Fiscally, I was exposed to danger as I traveled to go in the field. Uh, I could not pass through one the way when I go, I could not come back through the same way. Fear that I, our vehicle could uh, uh, come across light weapons and blow up. 1991, 92, 93, 94, that is the time when HIV was very high in Africa. I had to wear a diaphragm in the situation that I'm raped. I could not contract uh, HIV. Um, because the government uh, rejected being an island of peace and being uh, uh, a UN headquarter, they denied that we had clashes. And so, um, I was in the bad books with the government. Emotionally, as I was listening to their stories, I was impacted, but I did not have someone to talk to. I could not talk to my husband because he could ask me to stop the work. My boss in the office only cared about the results. I did not have somebody to join with me emotionally. And that is how I went back. I went down with the precarious trauma. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those um, powerful uh, illustrations and examples, both from um, Rhoda and uh, Dr. Tekla. We're so grateful for you sharing your experience. And I'm, I'm particularly energized by this presentation Thanks to the um, incredible student-led uh, team and work of the Mary Hook uh, Center for Reconciliation. I just want to say bravo to you and this work. It's really important. It is cutting edge and it's necessary for our field. I think what becomes clear to me when I'm listening to the research as well as the stories is that we are at a critical juncture. We Conflict has always been uh, complex, but I think we have a new form of complexity that we're facing in our globalized community and in the, the, 
the realm where information is so easily transferred across the globe and, and through social um, media and so on. We are in a place where uh, the conflicts have become not only complex, but complicated. And it seems to me that this work, beginning to understand insider reconcilers and their incredible role and function and how to resource and support them in their work is an absolutely important bridge to understanding peace building and conflict as systems, systems of, of conflict and systems that are changing and in flux. And who better can help us understand the system and respond than those within the system? It takes a lot more effort from, from the outside to try to understand a system. It takes a lot more time, a lot more effort, and often we get it wrong. And so when I think about this systems, I think about emergent adaptive systems, which we in the field are beginning to apply this work to. And these are systems that we have to understand the containers of the system. What holds the system? What is the form? What is the structure? Who can best understand that but the people inside who are living within that structure, within that container, they see it on a daily basis. They can identify it and say, hey, these are the parts of the structure or the container, the form that need to change. The second part of the system is to understand the differences that we have been told that may keep a system uh, going, uh, a, con a destructive system may continue because of these, these, um, these differences, or we're being told by social narratives that certain differences uh, in the system are unreconcilable. But it's the insiders, the insider reconcilers who can understand these differences and these, and these relationships. And that's, that's tied to the idea that all of these systems, a conflict system especially, has reciprocities. Sometimes these reciprocities are, these exchanges are for destruction. Sometimes they're for constructive means. But once again, I wanna propose that the insider reconciler is the best to understand these exchanges. They are in fact involved in those exchanges. Those exchanges and reciprocities are the ways they stay alive, the way they stay active, the, the way they work for well-being. They have to maneuver and negotiate those exchanges and those reciprocities every day. And so when we think about it that way, we think about the incredible resource that the insider reconcilers are, like we've heard today. The incredible um, approach that they, they take to see the community as not only deficits, but assets. They don't only see the negative of the conflict, they see where are people doing incredible work. They also see inclusion as necessary. We heard the gender dynamics in both of these stories. We heard Tekla talking about the youth and how to bring the youth in, and then both of them how to bring in the patriarchy and the culture of men that where the decision-making was, was still the focus at that point. And they did it with um, incredible creativity. I must say the embedded creativity of, the, of, of, of insiders is, is, is Un, we cannot, we cannot uh, underestimate that. We cannot um, uh, necessarily even um, replicate that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, enthralled and I'm remembering many insider peace builders and reconcilers that I have seen, worked with, heard their stories in the past. But I'm also aware that we wanna hear some of the questions that folks may have from the uh, participants who are here for our two invited panelists guests. Um, and so I'm going to um, turn that over and see if you have questions, please place those in the Q&A so that we can then um, um, turn those over to our esteemed panelists to respond to. So if you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A, please put your questions in there that you might have from the audience. I do want to say um, we, we have some flexibility um, for this process. We're obviously, we're aware that um, 
folks will need, those who have planned to leave at 11 will be free to do that. If there is interest to carry on, we can also negotiate that at this point. Um, and I just want to acknowledge those who are in the audience, the participants. Uh, we have a great group and some of them are familiar, uh, particularly my good friend and great insider peace builder reconciler, Jean-Claude Nkundwa from Burundi, who's worked in Burundi and Rwanda and Chad and many other places. It's so wonderful to see your name. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in if there's not questions coming from our, our, our audience. Um, let me say to the panelists again, thank you so much. And um, you've answered a number of really criti critical questions um, about your role. Uh, we saw it in example and how the insider role is so important to sustain reconciliation. Um, I guess my question for you right now would be, um, how is reconciliation um, sometimes feels like a foreign concept to you, and then other times you see it as a really important indigenous process that you know and recognize. Uh, this challenge of, of our globe and the outsider insider trying to define or enact reconciliation, when do you see that clashing? When have you seen that clashing in your experience? And I would love for Tekla or um, Rhoda to jump in if either of you have an example, a short incidence. The other question, if that one, if you wanna give some time to think on that is, what is the one message that you would want to send to external organizations, um, uh, facilitators, resources that you would want to send to them to say, this is how we could use your help. We don't want you to define how we can use your help. This is what we need. This is how you can accompany us. This is how you can walk alongside of us. Maybe that's an easier one. We'd love to hear that statement, that framed message that you would like to give. Uh, reconciliation, I think, has been professionalized, but um, conflict is as old as humanity. And uh, before I entered into a classroom to learn about reconciliation conflict, I knew that uh, communities have been in conflict. And uh, for us, the people who usually intervene in that conflict to start the reconciliation process, in some places they are elders. Uh, uh, in other places, it could be, if it's interpersonal, it could be um, a respected person from the community who commands uh, respect. Uh, where I see, um, Maybe the difference is the way reconciliation is a journey and a process can really take so long. But uh, when we have people coming to mediate from outside and they have time bound, we have to do this by this. That is where I see the conflicting. I think the process should start and the process should guide the process until we come to the solution. But uh, I see a lot of hurrying when it comes to the modern ways of uh, reconciliation. Mm. And uh, reconciliation for us, we don't have, we've not compart compartmentalized. Uh, this is problem solving, this is reconciliation, this is uh, conflict analysis. For us, it's really, as I said, it's a problem solving. And you move from one problem, one problem solving, you go to the next. For example, when I allowed the women to mourn instead of praying, I was dealing with emotional trauma healing. Mm -hmm. And unless we release that emotions, reconciliation cannot take place. So we don't divorce that. This time we are doing trauma healing, this time we are doing problem solving, this time we are doing conflict analysis, this time we are doing 
uh, reconciliation. For me, I see it's a journey and it could start anywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much. Dr. I think Rodin. it's too. Yeah, just to add more, what uh, Tekla said is uh, just the case I presented, I feel insider uh, to my knowledge of the cultural context, but also I feel outsider with the specific situations such as the case I presented. Also that emotions and personalizing some of the stories also need some uh, sort of skills uh, to play that role. So specifically with the reason I was there uh, to campaign as a female and, 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 and I went to, uh, to get seat as a parliament member, all the percep uh, negative perceptions against the women in the region, but also here you were asked to be involved in a very serious case. So just to kind of wait and, and, and fit and see and where you can fit on this situation. Also what is draining more is uh, once you are get involved, you have to kind of know uh, how to use your boundaries and, and also you could be uh, threatened off with this kind of situations because it needs more and more work. Uh, as of today, like the people from the other side of the clan, I, has, I just made it a short-term intervention for one clan. While I have to now be still involved and I don't know when all those cases will be closed because there is a prior history of killings between the clan. It's, it's just so you have to differentiate and you really have to be careful um, and, and draw a line in between. Thank you very much. Um, I, we, we, if you, we understand if you'll need to um, leave this space right now. There is one question that from the audience, and we'd love to give the last word to Aunt, Auntie um, to close up our time here. So if you're able to stay on for a few more minutes, um, we'll try to close this in about five minutes. Um, Enrico Nathaniel uh, asks this question, what's the biggest challenge in taking part of conflict resolution? Does any of you have to do a survey to the conflict area in order to find out the root causes of the problem? Uh, thank you so much for that question. But before I, I answer it, you asked it, that is why you asked earlier, what is one thing that uh, we need to call out? One thing I want to call out is that. Uh, Reconciliation needs to be facilitated. And it's a journey. The facilitation really takes time. The facilitation needs resources. Maybe pay transport for people to come, buy them tea or buy them soda. Some of us are community-centered peace and development workers, but that does not mean that we also have needs. Unfortunately, where we work, we work in the rural areas and at times we use a quiet diplomacy. Our work is not even known there unless you get closer. So we just want to call on partners to join with us financially or even just being there to encourage us. Concerning the challenge of conflict resolution, understanding the root causes of conflict. For me, listening was really key bringing the groups in, returning to both groups, individually one group, separately, then bringing them together. If, and you don't, don't, when you are working in Africa, don't just listen to what somebody stands there to narrate. Listen to their poems, listen to their songs, listen to their prayers then you will really get to understand the root causes. And thank God nowadays we have tools that can, you can engage the groups to help you understand the root causes. Like when you are dealing with the symptoms and root causes, the, the conflict tree, but let the people in conflict themselves, give them a chance to analyze that, then you will get to understand. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, to answer that question briefly, I will say the well-being of the peacemakers uh, is very important and critical. As Tekla talked about uh, bringing together uh, with a group of people and her, herself, or other colleagues that we have in Somalia being involved in such kind of gathering also can impact on them. So thinking about the well-being of the peacemakers and, 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 and that will be the uh, very serious challenging that needs to be addressed. Thank you both. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put one last question out because um, I think it's an interesting one. I don't think it has to be a long response, um, maybe a quick uh, response. It might be quite complicated, but let me just put it out there. But this, this question is very really important. And the, the audience asks, can you justify foreign intervention when there's an endless conflict in any country? Yes. <laughs> um, foreign intervention, yes. But with the support of the local. And where the trust is very low, at times the foreign intervention boosts that confidence. And once the confidence has been boosted, it will be good to work with the local support structures for sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Rhoda. Rhoda. Uh, thank you, Tagna. And yes, I think you both yes is justified or no. It depends how uh, some interventions can also be harmful and some international uh, organizations, they come on the ground just to take the boxes of delivering some of the work, especially when we are talking about trauma healing. I think I uh, made many speeches about uh, the peacemakers who are taking uh, the path of adding component of trauma healing to their work. Sometimes they might cause more harm than good because of the traumatizing uh, the participants without having the competency it needs to deliver those kind of things. But that's just one aspect. But um, as a, I think it's very... I'm sorry, uh, Rhoda, I think we lost your connection. And it has to be those who are really willing uh, to understand the cultural context has to be involved. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. This has been a very rich and important engagement. I'm going to turn it now to my good brother, Antti, to give any closing remarks. And thank you for those who stayed a little bit longer to keep this conversation going. Thank you for the call. And I text uh, the students on our chat that they've made me so super proud uh, that this humble intuition has been and is being shaped into science. Uh, uh, this has been one of the most gratifying um, webinars or, or events that I have attended just to observe how, how, how well they're doing that. Uh, but Carl, you and I have much larger challenge, which is communicating this knowledge into the policy level and funding level. We've always known you and I, because we've seen these people uh, on the work who are the heroes, the true heroes who are transforming Unfortunately, that understanding has not been shared. That's why we need some science, but we also need some, some tough hardcore policy. The, the beauty of this is that the peace building world and peace mediation world is broken. And I think there's more and more acknowledgement that we're not getting the results done by this Western mediator type of approach. You have to recognize that the, the real understanding and efforts are happening in the ground, but they can only succeed, like you indicated, when the policy framework is in support of and the funding streams are not taken by international organizations and used, like Tekla said, with their own time frame that doesn't support the piece itself. So we owe these efforts uh, and the next steps because of the work that the insiders are doing and, and, and Tekla and Rhoda, you always make me so proud. It's so honor to know you and have this chance to continue to work with you. And all of those 
also in the call, I'm calling for you to be an insider consider in Burundi. And I know that many of you are engaged in this work. Be our heroes in your community and, uh, and subscribe to MATR in case you want to be inspired by this work and get some ideas. Follow the podcast Ken has been creating with called Routes to learn from it and share your insights. Get in touch with us and share when you have beautiful case studies to share uh, so we can amplify your work. Thank you, everybody. Happy weekend. Thanks, everyone. Belle, did you want to pop in for one last thing? Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, Browdas and Tech Club stories are very powerful. Um, and I wanted to say that a lot of the things they were saying, they're already coming up in those 10 interviews that we're mm -hmm. analyzing. And I'm so glad um, it means we're in the right direction. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. MHCR staff, please go do something fun. <laughs> go take <laughs> your weekend. Go enjoy it. <clears throat> um, I'll see y'all soon. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone.